Andra moi en epemusa. Polutropon hos malla palaplante. Epie troye sieron taliethron e person. Palon d'anthropon idenastea kaino en egno. Polotogen ponto patanalgea hon catatumon. Arnumenos hente ptukein kainoston hetairon. Aludos eterus serus eto hi emenospe. Auton gas vetareis inatas talies sinolonto nepioi. Hoi catabus hupirionos helioi o estion. Autorotoisin na pele. Hi everyone, my name is Roy. A few weeks ago I made a video on the Iliad and today I decided to cover the sequel story, The Odyssey. The uh, Odyssey is together with the Iliad one of the major ancient Greek epic poems attributed to Homer. But as I already mentioned in my previous video, in recent years disputes arose over the figure Homer. By the way, Homer's real Greek name is Homeros. Homer is the corrupted English version. So many disputes arose over the figure Homer questioning his function in the creation of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Even his mere existence is questioned by some schoolers. I will leave the debate about Homer's authorship aside for now, but there are some really interesting articles online. As with the Iliad, the Odyssey is divided into 24 books. It follows the Greek hero Odysseus, king of Ithaca, a small island just west of continental Greece, and his journey home after the Trojan War, which lasted for 10 years and Odysseus' journey home lasts for 10 additional years. During his journey, he encounters many pearls and all his crewmates are killed. Back home, Odysseus is assumed dead by his wife Penelope and his son Telemachus. They both have to deal with a group of boisterous young men called the suitors, who battle for Penelope's hand in marriage. The Odyssey was originally composed in Homeric Greek, the form of Greek that was used by Homer in around the 8th or 7th century BCE. But the story itself is almost certainly a few centuries older, some schoolers even claim it to be as old as 1000 BC, but thoroughly substantiated claims about the Odyssey's origin are very difficult, if not impossible, to make. The story probably went down orally, being recited by Eidoses or Rhapsodes, a Greek bard who knew the story by heart. Throughout antiquity, the Iliad and the Odyssey were widely copied and used as school texts in lands where the Greek language was spoken. Schoolers may have begun to write commentaries on the poems as early as the time of Aristotle in the 4th century BCE and basically ever since the story haven't been out of the spotlight. The influence of the Homeric texts on Western culture is immense. Homer has been labeled the father of Western literature. His work formed the basis of education for members of ancient Mediterranean society. It is widely regarded by Western literary critics as a timeless classic and remains one of the oldest works of extant literature commonly read by Western audiences. The epic is composed in a dictalic hexameter, also called the Homeric hexameter. It opens in medias res, so in the middle of the overall story, but the prior events are described through flashbacks and storytelling. Also there are some notable differences between the Iliad and the Odyssey. A significant difference lays in a theme and idea. While the Iliad focuses on war, battles and fights, the Odyssey is a tale about adventures, trials and mythological creatures. When it comes to the nature of the poem, it can be said that the Iliad is more tragic because it ends with the destruction of Troy, while the Iliad ends in harmony and happiness. Also the main heroes in each epic differ thoroughly. While Achilles is praised for his fighting and physique qualities, Odysseus is called the man of many wiles, making him famous for his mental qualities rather than his physique. The first four books account the story of Telemachus, the son of Odysseus, who starts looking all around Greece for his father. Then from book 5 the perspective switches to Odysseus himself. Ten years have passed since the fall of Troy, and the Greek hero Odysseus still has not returned to his kingdom in Ithaca. A large and boisterous mob of suitors who have overrun Odysseus' palace and pillaged his land continue to court his wife Penelope. However, she has remained faithful to Odysseus. His son, Prince Telemachus, wants desperately to throw them out, but does not have the confidence nor experience to fight them. One of the suitors, Antinous, plans to assassinate the young prince, eliminating the only opposition to their dominion over the palace. Unknown to the suitors, Odysseus is still alive. The beautiful nymph Calypso, possessed by love for him, has imprisoned him on her island Ogygia. 
He longs to return to his wife and son, but he has no ship or a crew to help him escape. While the gods and goddesses of Mount Olympus debate Odysseus' future, Athena, Odysseus' strongest supporter among the gods, resolves to help Telemachus, and disguised as a friend of the prince's grandfather, she convinces the prince to call a meeting, at which he reproaches the suitors. Athena also prepares him for a great journey to Pylos and Sparta, where the kings Nestor and Menelaus, Odysseus' companions during the war, inform him that Odysseus is alive and trapped on Calypso's island. Telemachus makes plans to return home while, back in Ithaca, Antinous and the other suitors prepare an ambush to kill him when he reaches port. On Mount Olympus, Zoe sends Hermes to rescue Odysseus from Calypso. Hermes persuades Calypso to let Odysseus build a ship and leave. The homesick hero sets sail, but when Poseidon, god of the sea, finds him sailing home, he sends a storm to wreck Odysseus' ship. Poseidon has harbored a bitter grudge against Odysseus since the hero blinded his son, the Cyclophemus, earlier in his travels. Athena intervenes to save Odysseus from, Poseidon, from Poseidon's wrath, and the beleaguered king lands at Sheria, home of the Phaeacians. Nausicaa, the Phaeacian princess, shows him the royal palace and Odysseus receives a warm welcome from the king and queen. When he, when he identifies himself as Odysseus, his hosts who have heard of his exploits at Troy are stunned. They promise to give him safe passage to Ithaca, but first they beg to hear the story of his adventures. And so Odysseus starts telling his story. He recounts how, after the fall of Troy, his ship got driven off course by storms. He and his twelve ships landed on the island of the Lotus Eaters, who gave Odysseus' men fruits that made them forget their journey home. But the strong Odysseus managed to drag his crew back to the ships. Afterwards, they stopped on an island near the land of the Cyclops. The men entered the cave of the Cyclops Polyphemus, where they found all the cheeses and meat they desired. But when Polyphemus returned home, he sealed the entrance with a giant boulder. After the crew was caught, Polyphemus started devouring Odysseus' men. But the clever Odysseus devised an escape plan. He identified himself as nobody to Polyphemus and blinded the Cyclops with a wooden stick. Polyphemus cried for help and soon the other Cyclops arrived by the cave, but they eventually left because Polyphemus screamed that nobody had attacked him. Finally, Odysseus and his men managed to escape the cave by hiding on the underbellies of the sheep as they were let out of the cave. Next they sailed to the island of the witch goddess Kirke. She turned half of his men into swine with drugged cheese and wine. Odysseus, however, was resistant to Circe's magic because the god Hermes had given him a special herb called Molly. They stayed with her for over a year and then could leave. Upon their escape, they skirted the lands of the Sirens. All of the sailors had their ears plugged up with beeswax, except for Odysseus, who was tied to the mast as he wanted to hear the song. He told his sailors not to untie him as it would only make him drown. They landed on the island of Trinasia, where Odysseus' crew hunted down the sacred cattle of Helios, the sun god. Zeus punished them by wrecking their ships, all but Odysseus drowned. He managed to plunge himself to a fig tree, and he finally washed ashore on Ogygia, the island of the nymph Calypso, where he stayed for seven years. When Odysseus finishes his story, the Phaeacians are so stunned that they allow Odysseus to return to the island of Ithaca, where he seeks out the hood of his faithful swineherd, Emaos though Athena has disguised Odysseus as a beggar. Umaos warmly receives and nourishes him in the hut. He soon encounters Telemachus, who has returned from Pylos and Sparta despite the suitor's ambush, and reveals to him his true identity. Odysseus and Telemachus devise a plan to massacre the suitors and regain control of Ithaca. When Odysseus arrives at the palace the next day, still disguised as a beggar, he endures abuse and insults from the suitors. The only person who recognizes him is his old nurse, Erucleia, but she swears not to disclose his secret. Penelope takes an interest in this strange beggar, suspecting that he might be her long-lost husband. And so Penelope organizes an archery contest the following day and promises to marry any man who can string Odysseus' great bow and fire an arrow through a row of twelve axes, a feat that only Odysseus has ever been able to accomplish. At the contest, each shooter tries to string the bow and fails. Odysseus sets steps up to the bow and with little effort fires an arrow through all twelve axes. And he then turns the bow on the suitors, he and Telemachus assisted by a few faithful servants, kill every last suitor. 
Odysseus reveals himself to the entire palace and reunites with his loving Penelope. He travels to the outskirts of Ithaca to see his aging father, Lartes. They come under attack from the vengeful family members of the dead suitors, but Lartes, reinvigorated by his son's return, successfully kills Antinous' father and puts a stop to the attack. So he dispatches Athena to restore peace. With his power secure and his family reunited, Odysseus' long ordeal comes to an end. Throughout history, many scholars have tried to track down Odysseus' travels on a map. His wanderings are said to take place in the Pelenopes, but scholars, both ancient and modern, are divided as to whether any of the places visited by Odysseus are real. And now they agree that the landscapes include too many mythological aspects to be uncontroversially mapped. But this is a map showing how Odysseus could have traveled. That, so that's it for this video. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Have a nice day.